Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So before we get into today's video, I just wanted to go ahead and give a big thank you to today's sponsor, which is June's Journey. June's Journey is a hidden object mystery game set in the 1920s. Each scene takes you further into a murder mystery where you play as a character named June Parker in a quest to solve the murder of her sister and uncover more of her family's many secrets. June's Journey takes you through hundreds of colorful, beautiful, carefully painted scenes where you go and uncover all of these different clues and connect different parts of the puzzle. I love this game because you get to play detective and basically help solve a murder mystery. You find these different objects that are hidden in the scenes that are basically the clues that you use to connect the dots and figure out exactly what happened to June's sister. Each chapter takes you through so many different unexpected paths and twists and turns. The other thing that I love about this game is that it is completely free to download. As you guys probably know by now, I'm a very busy doctorate student who also comes here on YouTube and researches these different cases. So my mind is pretty much always going at a mile a minute. So it's nice to just sit back at the end of the day and play June's Journey as a way to relax and zone out. This game is just challenging enough to where you do have to think about things and get yourself through the game and put your observation skills to the test but not so hard that you are frying your brain after a long day of working. I love June's Journey because as a student in the medical field and a researcher of true crime, I really need to practice my observation skills because taking all these different clues and finding the little intricate details and connecting the dots and putting it all together is literally my job, whether it be researching or in the medical field. But I think it's good for pretty much anyone who is interested in true crime so that you can be that person that notices things that other people don't and take these clues that most people wouldn't notice and really figure out what could have happened. It's a really great way to just zone out and forget your problems for a bit and just keep your mind fresh at the same time. Again, it is completely free to download on iOS and Android, so you can use my link below to go ahead and start your journey today. Thank you again so much to June's Journey for sponsoring today's video. Now, let's get into the case. So this case is one that will have you very frustrated and appalled with how things were handled and how everything was allowed to happen in the first place. It's just so absolutely devastating and researching this case has just shook me to my core just because of how everything was able to play out and you'll see why in just a few minutes. But with that being said, let's just get right into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved murder of Andrew Sadik. Andrew Sadik was born November 22, 1993 in Valley City, North Dakota to parents Tammy and John Sadik. Andrew grew up in a town called Rogers, which is a very rural part of North Dakota. He was raised on his family's cattle farm, and according to his parents, he really loved being on the farm. He loved to fish, ice fish, and hunt. He enjoyed doing pretty much anything that involved the water, like swimming or any other water activities. He loved working on cars and he loved helping his dad raise the cattle. Andrew did have one older brother, but unfortunately, his brother actually died after being struck by a train when he was sitting at an unmarked railroad crossing in his car. Of course, this had a huge impact on Andrew and the family, but Andrew persevered and he was ready to exceed in his life despite this horrible tragedy. Andrew was known to be a very quiet, shy, and introverted young man. He had his small core group of friends that he could count on and besides that, he pretty much just kept to himself and stayed out of trouble. He attended Valley City High School, then went on to North Dakota State College of Science in Wapiton in 2012. He was studying to earn his associate's degree to go on and become an electrical technician. His family said that college was helping him become a lot more outgoing and sociable. He had roommates who he loved. He loved his teachers and he was doing very well in his classes. Right before his disappearance, he also began dating someone and he was pretty much always spending time with her. He was reserved, but he was very happy and very excited for his life. Now, during his first year of college, he pretty much just kept his head on straight 
attended classes, worked hard to get good grades, and basically just kept to himself. But at the same time, he was starting to become a lot more social and do more activities and go out with his friends. During his second year in April of 2013, Andrew started selling small amounts of weed to his classmates around campus meeting people in the parking lots to sell. He only sold very small amounts, so it's not like he was this huge drug lord or anything like that. But there were two times that he was actually caught by an undercover informant working for the Southeast Multi-County Agency, or SEMCA. He was first caught selling an eighth of an ounce for $60, with the other being a gram being sold for $20. So just enough for someone to smoke a couple of times, not really being a criminal amount to be caught with. However, to end your surprise, Selling drugs on school grounds, including a college campus, is actually a felony. Even if it's a very small amount like what he was selling, it doesn't matter how much someone is caught with, it just matters that they're caught on school grounds. So this is where all of Andrew's problems started. The once happy, carefree young man who was never known to get into trouble or disobey authority was now caught up in some very serious stuff. So by November of 2013, based on him getting caught, officers from Semka searched Andrew's dorm room and found a grinder which had marijuana residue in it. He admitted to officers that this did belong to him, but at this point he was not arrested or charged with anything. However, the next day, Andrew had to meet up with the rich Richland County Deputy Sheriff Jason Weber. He told Andrew that selling marijuana on a college campus is a Class A felony and he could be facing up to 40 years in prison if he is convicted. Which is just ridiculous because people who murder other people can be facing less severe punishments than a kid who sold weed to his classmates but that's not the point right now. So the SEMCA is made up of several agencies in the neighboring counties whose main goal was to catch drug crimes. Now, Andrew knew that he probably would get a much lighter sentence than 40 years in jail, but he didn't want to have to risk any jail time or having a felony on his record. Like I said, he was a bright young man who was just looking forward to his future and didn't want anything to get in the way of that. So, Jason Weber told Andrew that if he became an informant for them, he could possibly make this all go away. With this offer, Andrew felt that he pretty much had no choice. I have a video of the interview so you can see exactly how it happened. All right, well, you expressed interest that you probably want to help yourself out. Yeah. Okay, like I said, you're facing two felonies and then, of course, a misdemeanor charge from yesterday. Two felonies uh, of deliveries uh, since they took place on campus, both of them, um, they're enhanced, so they're Class A felonies. Uh, 20 years in prison, $20,000 fine, and or both. Okay, so potentially the max is 40 years in prison, $40,000 fine. You understand that? Yeah. Okay, obviously you're probably not going to get 40 years, but uh, is it a good possibility that you're going to get pr some prison time? Um, if you don't help yourself out, yeah, there is. Okay. That's probably not a way to start off your young adult life and your career, right? What I'm going to ask for you to do is to do some buys for me then. Okay. And where you'd have to wear a wire, you'd have to go buy marijuana from individuals, and then, you know, depend upon how you do and so forth, you know, a lot of this could go away. You know, are you, is it all going to go away? Probably not. Are you going to probably have to plead guilty to like maybe a misdemeanor possession of marijuana? Probably, but at least you're not pleading guilty to felonies. Okay, is that fair enough? Very fair. Okay. Uh, is there individuals that you know on campus or around town or whatever that you can buy from? There's one chick that sells out of the campus apartments that I know of. Who's that? I'm not sure on the name, but I have a few buddies that buy from her. You're going to have to do it more than just two people to get that, you know, the felony levels down. I understand. You know, I mean, time is, of the, I mean, time is not a problem. You, uh, you're here for next semester, right? In all of next year. In all of next year? Most likely, yes. Okay. Well, I don't want to drag it out all of next year, yeah. but I mean, I'll, you know, we could drag this out, you know, into after Christmas type deal, you know, but I don't want to drag it out into your next year. Who's your roommate? Do you, do you normally get it for your roommate or what? No. Your he roommate gets, gets his own? His, yeah. Who's he normally get it from? Some guy in Fargo. What do you guys normally just meet up in a parking lot in Fargo or somewhere? Yeah, gas station. 
Okay. Well, I'll sign you up, and then you, it's up to you to make your contacts, okay, and go from there. You know, we got a, you know, you got two felonies hanging over your head, so we're gonna look at probably doing um, each individual we do. We have to do two deals on, okay. So you have to do two deals on per individual, and then um, we're gonna be looking at probably you know three or four individuals that you're gonna have to do, okay. Okay. Is that fair enough? Okay. I mean, it sounds like you already got two for sure that you can do. It's just a matter of doing two more. Okay. And like I said, we'll give you the time to do it, to, you know, relatively speaking. I don't want it to go into the summer, obviously, and stuff. Yeah. But we want to, the faster we can get it cleared up, the faster you can get it cleared up. Do you understand? I understand. So can you buy anything other than marijuana? Not saying it's for you, but could you go say it's for a buddy? I could try. Okay. Do you understand that you are not to divulge to any person except to the agent whom you are associated with, your status as a confidential informant for the BCI, and that you will not use your association with the BCI to resolve your personal problems. Now, with that is basically, if you get jammed up in trouble with the police or anything, don't tell them, any law enforcement officers that you are associated with me, okay, at the time. Whatever you did, take your lumps, and then you call me afterwards, okay, and then we'll work it out. Um, not that we don't trust cops, it's just, uh, you're not gonna throw that card out there. On the, on the second token is, you can't tell anybody you're working for me, obvious, for obvious reasons. Not even, you try not to tell your roommate, anybody, because the more people that know, if that word gets out, you know as well as I do, people are gonna think you're a narc, and nobody's gonna work with you. I mean, nobody will touch you. Of course, if you can't buy dope, you're not getting to me, okay? You understand that? All right. So, I understand. Do you understand that you are to report to me um, who you're assigned to work with is on a continuous basis while actively associated with BCI? You're going to have to check in with me every so often um, that we see fit. Um, if you don't check in with me or if I lose contact with you, I'm just going to assume that you don't want to work anymore and then I'm just going to cut the warrants for your arrest and then uh, throw you in jail. So you're going to have to keep, you know, on a, not like on a daily basis, but every few days you're just going to have to check in just say, hey, uh, this is what I found out or I'm working on this or I maybe got nothing. but. You're gonna have to check in with me and we'll go over that one more time here. You understand that? Yes. What that is, is basically, you're gonna do these deals, you're our state witness, okay? Um, if they take it to a jury trial, you may have to come back and testify against the individual that you purchased narcotics from. Do you understand that? Now, with that, I know there's some hesitation. Now, with that, uh, I've been doing this a long time, my partners have been doing this a long time, we have never, ever had anybody come back to testify yet. Um, the reason for that is, one, we do, that's why we do two buys on an individual. Um, it secures up the cases, it really makes them strong. Um, so uh, two things happen. One, they either take a plea agreement, or number two, they end up working like in your situation. We might give them an opportunity to work and then, uh, then you, they don't have to come back and so forth, you don't have to come back. We've never had anybody have to testify. I'm just telling you, could it happen? It could happen. We just have never had that because nobody wants to really go to a jury trial and try to chance that they're going to get 40 years in prison. So, so I'm not going to be, they're not going to know that I rented them out. They, here's how we do it, okay. Um, you're going to do the deals, okay. I'm not going to go jam them up tomorrow, okay. We wait. Um, we're going to wait a few months, just like in your situation. You have no clue who probably ratted you out. You have no clue when this happened, okay. You probably maybe try to think of ideas and stuff, but I'm not going to tell you, okay? That's how we're going to treat whoever you purchase from. We're going to wait a while, let them still sell to other people, and then by the time we go jam them up, they're going to they're not going to know. You can, uh, when you check in, you can call. A text message works just fine. Uh, we do a lot of texting just because it's, um, you know, if you're around friends and stuff, you can just text real quick or what you find out and stuff. You don't have to make a phone call. See what you can get lined up, okay? And then uh, the biggest thing is about lining up deals, okay? It's up to you to kind of somewhat line them up, but don't make anything definite, yeah. okay? Any questions that you have for me? No. Okay, if any questions come up, give me a holler or whatever, but start working on your contacts. Let's get some of these deals done. That way, the faster you get done, the faster so it's cleared up. this gets cleared up and you don't have this weighing on you and so forth. All right. If you have no questions, then I'll kick you loose, and then we'll go from there. So, I'll be keeping in touch. Uh, the biggest thing too is when you start, if you don't know these people, the biggest thing is to try to find out who these people are that you're buying from too, because we can't just buy from people that don't know. A certain amount, if you want me to purchase or get anything. Try to get what you normally get. You know, we try to get if you, you know, try to get a quarter. Is that what you normally kind of get? 
Eighth quarter, yeah. Eighth or a quarter, yeah. I mean, try to get, if you can try to get a quarter, get it. If you can only get an eighth, that's fine too. Okay. You know, I mean, it's, uh, in North Dakota, it doesn't matter, if, you know, whether you sell a joint or you sell, you know, an ounce, it doesn't, it's still the same felony charge. I mean, we'd like to get the weights up there just a little bit, I mean, just to show, but it's not a big deal. So, if you normally buy an eighth, that's what you're normally buying. Okay. So be it. So, okay. So, they wanted Andrew to wear a wire. And they not only wanted him to go after other, you know, low level dealers on his college campus, but to go into neighboring cities and to help catch higher level dealers. He was asked if he knew anyone that he could buy from and Andrew said that he knew a couple. Deputy Weber asked where his roommate gets his weed from and he said that he gets it from someone in Fargo, doesn't know exactly who. So Weber basically told him to go ahead and make his own connections. The deal was that he needed to go and buy from three to four different individuals, two to three times each. Weber said that he had time to go ahead and do all these buys, but said that he wanted all of them to be done before the semester was over. Andrew, of course, expressed concerns asking if, you know, the people he turns in will know that it was him who turned them in. And Weber said no, that they wait a certain amount of time after the exchange to make the arrest so that they don't make the connection. But he did say there was a possibility that Andrew would have to testify against this person in court, but assured him that through all of his years, working as a deputy, he has never once seen an informant have to testify. Weber told him that he would need to update him every few days, either by call or if he wanted to text, that was fine. He said that if he stopped contacting him, that he would have no choice but to issue a warrant for his arrest for the original felony charge. They painted this as a way to lessen his charges and help him avoid a long jail sentence or massive fines, and maybe he just gets stuck with a misdemeanor. This was a very common type of deal that they would make when someone was caught doing this type of crime. What they did not tell him though was that this can be a very dangerous job even if you are only dealing with marijuana. So over the following three months, Andrew went on three buys on campus. The first was in November of 2014, right after he began his job as an informant. He bought an eighth of an ounce from a dealer on campus in the parking lot for $60. He bought another eighth of an ounce for $60, again from the same dealer in December. Then in January, he was directed by Weber to buy from a different individual. Now, Andrew did not know this person personally, but was able to successfully buy from him. However, after this buy with the new person, Andrew stopped all contact with Weber. Like I mentioned earlier, Andrew needed to constantly update Weber or else he could be arrested and Andrew said that he understood and up to this point, he had been cooperating. He was keeping in contact like he was supposed to until he just suddenly stopped. Weber had tried to reach out to Andrew several times, but Andrew never got back to him. So at this point, he needed to do one more buy from the same dealer, then one more buy from a third dealer. After this, his obligations would have been fulfilled. At the same time that he was doing these buys and working as an informant, Andrew was prepared to start his next chapters in his life. He had been traveling to different towns in North Dakota like Bismarck and Grand Forks, doing interviews to start his career as an electrician after he graduated in about two months. He was preparing to graduate and according to his family, he was very, very excited. Now on the weekend of April 25th, 2014, Andrew went back to Rogers to his parents' home to help with the cattle on the farm. According to his parents, at this point, he was acting completely normally and he seemed very happy. He helped his father transfer the cows to another pasture while his mother was out of town. He left from home at around 6 p.m. on the night of April 27th after telling his dad that he had a date that night. Then, at around 10 p.m. the same night, he had spoken to his mother on the phone and, you know, she told him that he was safe at home and they had also talked about the data on their family cell phone plan. They had been reaching their data limit and I'm sure they were just trying to get on the same page to make sure they wanted to avoid one of those family fights over data like I'm sure we have all been in. But after this call, unfortunately, 
Andrew had never been in contact with his family ever again. Then on the night of Wednesday, April 30th, Andrew went out with his roommate, Drew Kugel, and some other friends. After going out, they returned back to their dorm to watch some movies before going to bed. However, when Drew woke up the next morning, Andrew was no longer there. Now, at first, Drew was not all that concerned. Drew thought that Andrew probably just left to go see his girlfriend. Now, he was, you know, keeping an eye out. He was a little bit suspicious because he did admit that in the past, Andrew had usually asked Drew if he wanted to come with him, you know, when he went to go out or see his girlfriend, but this time Andrew did not invite him. But then the next day rolled around and Andrew still had not been to any of his classes that day. By the time May 3rd came around, Drew was really starting to worry and asked different friends if they had seen him anywhere, if anyone had seen him in class or anything like that, but still no one had. So at this point, they all reported him missing to the campus police. So the first thing that police did was review the security footage at the dorm to find out if and when he left. Security cameras at the dorm captured him leaving the building at around 2.30 a.m. on May 1st, wearing a Tampa Bay Buccaneers hoodie, jeans, and carrying a black backpack. They also noted that he was carrying his cell phone, but the cell phone was turned off. Now, initially, police just assumed that Andrew was fleeing to avoid his work as an informant and was just going off to hide somewhere. So they decided to go ahead and charge him with those felony charges and put out warrants for his arrest in the hopes that, I guess, this would make him come back or... I don't know, since they had told him before that he would be charged with these things if he stopped contact. His parents went to the media to plea for him to come back, if for nothing else, to come back to help with the cattle farm because again, they knew how much he loved helping with the cattle. But when he was absolutely nowhere to be found, police, the family, and volunteers set out to search for Andrew. So the Richland County's Sheriff's Office conducted their search on foot in the air and used sniffer dogs to search the different areas around the Wapaton area. They also searched the nearby river initially, but they did not find anything. They have received a tip where someone said that they saw him walking late Sunday afternoon near Tyler, North Dakota, so police went and searched that area as well, but they came up with nothing. At this point, they really had no idea why he would have left or if something happened to him or what was going on. At this point, like I said, police thought that he might be on the run from his duties. However, no one around him knew what he was doing. His roommates, his family, his friends, none of them reportedly knew about him being an informant. By May 9th, his charges finally became public and his family finally found out about him being caught with weed, then subsequently working as an informant. Of course, Andrew's parents were pissed because this entire time, they had no idea that he had been doing this and police waited almost a week to tell them. They wondered if police really didn't try as hard as they could have to find Andrew because they just assumed that he was on the run. Either way, the searches for Andrew continued. Over the next two months, police, family, friends, and classmates all railed together to search anywhere that they possibly could for Andrew. Police started interviewing those close to Andrew to see if there was any indication that he wanted to leave or end his life or anything along those lines. They interviewed his girlfriend to see if she knew anything, but all police were getting was the same story of a young man who was excited about life. He was ready to be done with school and start working and just begin his career as an electrician. Then, after two months of searching on June 27, 2014, Andrew's remains were found. So, police were doing a routine dive training exercise when they happened upon Andrew's remains in the Red River near Breckenridge, Minnesota, which is about a mile from Wapaton, just across state lines into Minnesota. His remains were in pretty bad condition, so they had to identify him through dental records, 
and there was no apparent cause of death at this point, so they sent out his body for an autopsy. By August of 2014, the results were in and they raised even more questions. So Andrew's cause of death was from a small caliber gunshot wound to the head, but the autopsy could not determine if this wound had been self-inflicted or if he was the victim of homicide. However, when his body was found, he was wearing clothes that did not appear to belong to him. He was wearing a jacket different than the one that he was last seen in on surveillance video, and neither his family or his friends recognized this jacket whatsoever. The Buccaneers hoodie that he was wearing in the surveillance video was nowhere to be found, and his wallet was also missing. Plus, when he was found, he was found with his arms still through the straps of his backpack like normal, but the backpack was also tied around him, and the backpack was filled with rocks. There was no suicide note, and again, no one around him thought that there was any way that he could have done this to himself. Now, it did come out that a 22 caliber pistol was missing from the family home, so the theory now was that Andrew could have taken the gun when he was visiting the home the weekend before he died. So police used this to then say that he could have used this gun to take his own life. However, it could have just as easily been something he took to defend himself, but then it was turned around and used against him. Now, a few days after Andrew's disappearance, so just rewinding a little bit, police gave family the possession of Andrew's car. Tammy inspected the car and found that the carpet in the car was soaking wet. She also said that it was wet underneath in the trunk and that there were several inches of water in the spare tire well. So this supported Tammy's theory that Andrew was killed and then dumped in the water. Witnesses also came forward saying that on the night that Andrew went missing, she saw three people cleaning out the trunk of a car that looked very similar to Andrew's car. When they went to see if, you know, they saw this on surveillance video, you know, in the parking lot that this was claimed to have been seen in, of course, turns out the cameras were not working that night. So because of this, Tammy asked the North Dakota's Attorney General, Wayne Stenham, to investigate Semka's handling of Andrew in his role as an informant. So he put together a panel of three veteran officers. Two were from North Dakota and one was from South Dakota. The officers from Semka's board went on to defend their use of informants, saying that these types of investigation were done pretty much the same way as anywhere else. They said that Semka did nothing wrong and that they never did anything that warranted them being charged with anything. So Tammy asked that they request the help of higher state and federal law enforcement agencies to properly investigate their son's death. So a report came out in 2015 that said most of its handling with Andrew followed procedure and law, but it did place the task force under the authority of a BCI agent since at the time of Andrew's death, it was one of two multi-jurisdictional task forces that was not. Tammy said in an interview, quote, Andrew was murdered, and this report actually reinforces that in our minds. We know that, and we know that they're not even looking at anything. Did somebody he was trying to get for them do it, or somebody he already got? Semka is alive and well on campus. They're still using kids. They're not protecting these kids. She is pissed that these agencies are using college kids as informants to try and pin down drug dealers when there's no possible way of them knowing what they are getting themselves into. They weren't doing enough to protect these college kids, and Andrew is seemingly not the only one who has been harmed doing this type of work under very little supervision. There are so many other kids that were arrested on drug charges very similar to this who were given the option of either going to jail for years and years and years for their very minor possessions 
or working as an informant and putting their lives in danger to try and wipe the record clean. They are not given proper training. They don't have the experience and they aren't totally informed of the danger that they are putting themselves into. So that is where this case brings up so many other issues. Andrew's case remains unsolved and that's pretty much all of the information that we know. Many people speculate that his involvement as an informant is what caused his case to go under-investigated, especially since it was assumed at first that he was just fleeing. So in 2016, the family filed a lawsuit against the state of North Dakota and Deputy Jason Weber saying that they did not properly supervise Andrew. Andrew's family's attorney had stated that they just want the state to take accountability for what happened to Andrew. They sued for economic damages such as the cost of the funeral and non-financial damages such as emotional distress and intense grief. Kemi stated that this was just their last hope at getting any answers. And after having their court date pushed back several times, their case was heard on December 19th, 2019. Tatum O'Brien, a Fargo attorney that represents the Sadik family, argued that Andrew's death was connected to his work as an informant. He received limited training, he was not aware of the undercover work hazards, he was pressured to conduct more serious drug sales than he initially thought, and was not properly supervised. He said that Weber had no idea who Andrew was talking to and that they did not investigate the people who Andrew was dealing with. Weber did not care who Andrew talked to, he only cared about the number of buys, which was made clear in the interview that we all saw. In Jason Weber's eyes, it didn't make any difference if this was a violent gang member that Andrew was dealing with or just some college kid who was just trying to get his hands on a little bit of pot. The defense attorney, Corey Quinton, argued that they don't know why Andrew left his dorm room, where he intended to go or how he died. There was no real evidence linking his death to his work as an informant. At the end, Southeast District Judge Jay Schmitz dismissed the wrongful death lawsuit saying, quote, The stark reality of this case is that there is not, and perhaps never can be, any evidence of how, when, where, or why Andrew Sadik died. So they did make an appeal and are waiting to be heard by the North Dakota Supreme Court. Also, in 2017, Andrew's law was signed into law by the governor of North Dakota. This law states that they must train all confidential informants that reasonable protective measures be placed, in addition to written acknowledgement to the informants that they have the right to request an attorney and that they can discontinue work as an informant at any time. It also requires that an independent investigation happens into the agency when an informant dies. So that's pretty much where we are left in the case. And now let's get into the main theories into Andrew's death. So the first theory is that Andrew took his own life, which is what police had been saying ever since his body was found. In this theory, they have said that maybe Andrew felt overwhelmed with his duty as an informant, or maybe he felt guilty, or maybe he just didn't want to be an informant anymore, and this was the only way that he knew out. He didn't want to go to jail, but he knew that if he didn't continue his work as an informant, that he would be facing some stiff punishments. Those who believe in this theory believe that when he went home to visit his parents the weekend before he died, he stole that 22 caliber pistol and shot himself with it. They have also said that this last visit to his family was his way of saying goodbye to them. However, the stolen pistol is literally the only thing that is pointing to this theory in my opinion. Andrew was only two weeks away from graduating and was very, very excited to start his new life and his new career. He was going out of his way to go on job interviews, start preparing for his future, even while he was working as an informant. He loved his roommates, he loved his family, and he had a new girlfriend who he absolutely loved spending time with. He was hanging out with friends that very same night, having fun, and was showing absolutely zero signs of him wanting to end his life whatsoever. When you have a roommate who you're close to and you see all the time, you know, it gets to a point where they can either see signs or even after it happens, they say, you know, in retrospect, 
those are the signs I should have done something of course there's a lot of guilt but he didn't show any of that and there's no you know looking back and you're thinking hmm maybe those were signs I didn't see that anywhere plus he was found with his backpack stuffed with rocks wearing different clothes that nobody recognized his car was also wet and his trunk was filled with water so in order for this theory to be true in my head this is pretty much the only way that it could have gone down is that he left his dorm bought a new jacket or borrowed a jacket from someone that just hasn't come forward for whatever reason um, stuffed his own backpack with rocks tied his own backpack around himself drove his car to the river either submerged the car dumped water in it or maybe jumped in the river and came back to his car and then got water in it and then drove his car back to campus and then walked over to the river again and then jumped in the river while shooting himself in the head and somehow getting rid of the gun since that was never recovered as far as I have seen. It literally does not make a bit of sense. You cannot shoot yourself and then jump into water unless he decided to weigh himself down go underwater and then shoot himself and somehow the gun was just never found which literally makes absolutely no sense so we are assuming he went through this entire process without showing any signs to anybody whatsoever he was seen on surveillance video just casually walking out showing no signs of wanting to do such this you know immaculate plan and then didn't even leave a note behind for anybody. I just think that the way he was found just shows that this theory literally is not possible just because, again, of how it would have gone down. It does not make any sense whatsoever for anyone to have believed that he took his own life this way. I personally do not think that he killed himself, and the only way that I could see this working out is if he hired someone to come and kill him. That is the only way I think this even makes a bit of sense. But even that does not make sense to me. I don't think this theory is very true at all. And I think if anyone were to look at the evidence objectively and not have some other ulterior motive, I don't think there's any way that someone could have ever come to this conclusion. So to me, I think that, you know, police maybe had a motive of not wanting to be blamed for someone dying on their watch. So they somehow said that this was a suicide, even though none of the evidence points towards it. The next theory is that Andrew was killed by someone he was trying to catch when he was an informant. Maybe it was someone who he was going to meet that night. Maybe it was someone who he had already bought from. I don't know because I honestly have no idea why he would have left in the middle of the night, what would have made him leave his dorm in the middle of the night like that. That's honestly something that I don't have an answer for. If it was someone that he knew and was going to sell to, maybe a friend, that could make sense, or someone he had already sold to who asked him, you know, hey, do you want to go, you know, do this by in the middle of the night so we don't get caught or something like that. I don't know. That could make sense. Um, but as for why he left at 2.30 in the morning, I honestly do not have an answer for that. But if we consider the evidence I just mentioned before, it definitely, definitely points to a homicide way more than a suicide. So I think it's possible that Andrew took the gun from his parents' house because he knew he was dealing with dangerous people and was afraid, especially after the second buy. We know that he stopped communicating with Weber after the second buy. We don't know exactly why he stopped communicating with Weber, but it just so happened to be after the second buy. So I think maybe he met this person and he thought that this person was dangerous and he didn't want to buy from him again. And you know, he knew that Weber wouldn't like that because Weber was the one who introduced this person to him. And we know that Weber didn't care who Andrew had to deal with. So I think it's very possible that he knew his life was in danger from this guy. Maybe this guy found out he was an informant, I don't know. And that's why he went and got the gun. So let's just say that night he went to go sell to this person again because you know he knew he had to finish his duty as an informant, but he brought the gun with him because he was afraid. Maybe 
at this point the person found out that Andrew was an informant or maybe they had found out you know before and that's why they wanted to meet Andrew at 2 30 in the morning either way I think maybe this person found out and then saw his gun or maybe Andrew pulled out the gun to defend himself if this person was starting to attack him and then the gun was taken by whoever harmed Andrew and then was used against Andrew. I think that makes a lot more sense, especially if Andrew, he doesn't want to hurt anyone. He didn't go into this because he is a violent criminal or anything like that. So I imagine even if someone's harming him, he probably was very, very timid and didn't want to hurt anyone. And that person knew that, saw that, saw his weakness and turned around, grabbed the gun and used it against him. I think this person probably had someone with him who helped him which is why I think it's possible that this person knew Andrew was an informant and wanted to meet him at 2.30 in the morning, again, to do this in the middle of the night. And then I think they probably could have brought someone to help because this is what they had planned on doing. I think this and this other person put Andrew's body into the trunk and then it got wet because they were cleaning out the trunk to clear of any evidence. And then when it comes to the jacket, I honestly don't know why I think this person would have changed his jacket instead of maybe stripping him down. Um, maybe they put this jacket on him to make him harder to identify, but I think at the same time, stripping him down would have done the same thing. But at the same time, maybe they thought if someone finds his body, it's wearing a different jacket than the one Andrew was found in, so there's no way that they can connect the two. I'm honestly not sure what I think about the jacket, but I do think it's possible that someone changed it. But then I think after they killed him, they stuffed his backpack with rocks tied the backpack to him to make sure that it would not come loose and then dumped him in the river so that he would stay in the bottom of the river until he decomposed fully and then made him impossible to find but fortunately he was found before he was given the chance to decompose. I think they took his wallet, his gun, and his clothes and then hid them elsewhere. Again, I think they then cleaned the car and then parked it. And then the witness of, you know, them seeing these people cleaning out the trunk of a car in the parking lot in a car that looked very similar to Andrew's in the middle of the night. I do think that that could be credible. To me, all of this seems much more of a viable answer than him doing all of this to himself. And to me, it's pretty obvious that it's very, very clearly a murder. The literal only thing that police have that points us to a suicide is the fact that he took his gun from a parents, but even this, you know, we can just as easily say that someone used it against him. Just because someone had a gun, it does not mean that it's impossible for someone to take it from them and then use it against the person who owns the gun. And even then, we don't know for 100% certainty that he was even killed with this specific gun. They never found the gun. And I don't know if there was a way that they could have, you know, I don't know if the bullet was still in him or anything like that and they matched it to the gun but as far as i saw they just connected you know him being killed by a small caliber gun to the gun being missing and then connected the dots from there so there are a few other theories in this case and i will briefly go over those but i personally don't think that they hold a lot of ground and they're not worth spending that much time over in my opinion so the other theory in terms of him being killed is that an officer related to Semka had killed Andrew. This is one of those theories that is pretty much only speculation and doesn't have any real backing. The only real thing that I think could point to this theory is that they have the motive, you know, if they were afraid of getting in trouble or I don't know, if they did something wrong that they didn't want anyone to find out about. Um, it is pretty suspicious that they really did not want to investigate this from the very beginning, but I, you know, obviously think that that can be attributed to the fact that they just thought he was running. I don't think that they did a piss poor investigation because one of the officers killed him because they wouldn't have even had to do an investigation in the first place if one of the officers did not kill him. Um, I think this would have done more harm than good for Semka. So I personally don't think this theory is very credible. The other theory is that, you know, maybe the girlfriend had something to do with it. And again, I think the only reason that people think this is because, you know, there's always a possibility that, you know, someone in a relationship does something to their partner, but police had interviewed her and they don't think she's a suspect at all. 
The family doesn't suspect her either and they stand behind her and say that she's just the sweetest thing and there's no evidence pointing towards her whatsoever. It's just a speculation that people have made. So as you guys can probably tell, I don't think any of these other theories are very likely at all. I think that the most likely theory is that he was killed in relationship to one of the people he was buying from or was going to buy from or that someone was tipped off about Andrew, you know, being an informant and they just wanted to get rid of him. Either way, I think that his job as a confidential informant was the reason that he was killed and I think if he never took this job, was never convinced into doing it, I think that he would still be alive today. Either way, even if, you know, someone completely random had killed Andrew, there's no possible way in my eyes that it was a suicide. I think it is very obvious that someone took Andrew's life. I think police did him a massive injustice by sticking to their assumption that he just killed himself because they are lazy and they don't want to do an investigation and they don't want to take responsibility. I think we can all see that there's no evidence pointing towards him killing himself and that all the evidence points towards Semka not wanting to take any responsibility. I think that the way this case was handled is just unbelievable and the fact that there's no justice for this young man is absolutely heartbreaking. His parents not only had to lose their firstborn son, but their only other child as well. Imagine having two children and losing both of them. It's not like Andrew was involved in crazy stuff like heroin or gangs or violence or anything like that. He was literally a college student who was selling small bits of weed to his classmates to make a little bit of side money. That literally is such a small crime and the fact that there's such stiff punishments for it is absolutely horrendous. The fact that even just a possibility of 40 years is atrocious because again, even though no one's actually gonna get 40 years, hopefully, that's just me assuming, but hopefully, you know, to a college student, oh my God, 40 years, that's a long time. I don't wanna to go to jail, fine, I'll just work as an informant. That is most likely what's going through these college kids' heads when they are faced with the choice of going to jail or being an informant. This is just too much to have to pay for a 20 year old who made a very, very minor mistake in his life. He shouldn't have had to pay for selling a little bit of weed with his life, but he did because of Semka. I think it's because of them. My heart goes out to his family, his friends, his girlfriend, and anybody else who was affected by this senseless killing. So that is all I have for today's video. Thank you guys so much for listening to Andrew's story. And now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that he was killed in relation to being an informant? Do you think that it was one of these officers? Do you think that Andrew took his own life or do you think somehow the girlfriend had something to do with it? Please let me know in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And don't forget to click my link below to go ahead and download June's journey. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.